Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Yes, we're live on Facebook, Asia Tech Podcast. Welcome. It's Tuesday evening. Graham Brown, Michael Waits, Asia Tech Podcast. We are talking about our, well, good news, tour coming up August, September, October. I want to start with a quote and just hand it over to you, Michael. A quote that I read today. John Le Carre, the author. Yes. He said that the, a desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. So I'm getting philosophical yeah. to start off with. I'm teeing you up, Michael. Discuss. <laughs> like I need to be teed up. Um, yeah, a desk <laughs> is a very dangerous place to view the world. And I, I would know, actually, because I sat at a desk for, I don't know, 21 years. And I'm telling you, it was a very dangerous place to view the world. I know some people that are still doing it. I'm not sure if they still have their soul. Um, the best place to see the world actually is in the world. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, especially, you know, especially for us, we live digital lives, don't we? Especially most of the startups we're involved in are very digital. Yeah. I mean, look, you and I are not the classic digital nomad, but I mean, boy, we move around a lot. Yeah. And we could go through where you've lived in the past 10 years and where I've lived in the past 10 years, but just we the places that we've visited. <laughs> no, no way. Well, definitely not for you. And I mean, for me, you know, what? just what I've done over the past five or six years, I've been all over this region a bunch yeah. of times. I mean, I've already, this year, I've already been in Japan two times. I was in Japan two or three times the previous year. I mean, it's just continuous Singapore, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia. I have not been in Vietnam which we will rectify yep. um, in 20 years. Yeah. And more, and, and more, 25 years. Don't forget Myanmar. Yeah. Neither Myanmar of us have been cannot, to Myanmar, right? Nope. Never been there. I mean, every place that we think we're going to go from now on, we, I will have been, but I have not. So, you know, let's talk about where we're going to go first. Right. So start where do you want to go first? Start at the top. <laughs> where do we want to go first? Well, well, I well, think, you know, so, we, why have we picked these cities? So we've picked five cities as a starting point, but there will be more, right? So why have we picked these cities? What's the rationale behind them? Because we well, we brainstormed these, right? We put a lot of thought into it. Yeah, we did. And we spent a lot of time last week, actually. And, and I think last week was actually one of our most popular episodes, right? Is what makes yeah. a great startup city? And I think that's the premise for this. When, as we were thinking about doing last week, we thought about, what are we going to do going forward as well? And how are we going to figure out what are the best startup cities? And the idea really was, let's go visit them. Yeah. All right. So let's go. Let's meet the people that are actually there. Let's really find out. You know, we live in specific places, but I think it's incumbent upon us to go to those places, meet the people there that say that they're like the linchpins and, and the big pieces of the startup's um, ecosystem there. Yeah. And let's go find out what they have to say and what they're doing every day. It's the only way to really experience it, right? We talk about this all the time. You want to learn a language? Go live in that country. Go live where that language is spoken. And I think it's the same thing for figuring out what the tech ecosystem is like. You want to know what it's like in Ho Chi Minh City? Go to Ho Chi Minh. But first, I want to talk about going to Fukuoka. Yeah. Okay? So why do we want to do that? And we talked about this a little bit. Um, we talked about this a little bit last week, right? I think that was the first or second. I can't remember, right? But if you look at Fukuoka, it's, you know, in Japan, obviously, but it's in Kyushu. So in a secondary island in Japan. But the big thing we talked about last week was, you know, they're trying to do something that's outside of Tokyo. They're trying to do something that's a little bit alternative in a place where maybe everybody's not focusing. Maybe it's as a test for the whole country. Maybe not. Maybe the, um, the mayor there is just really forward looking. Yeah. And maybe he's saying, you know what, I can do stuff down here that nobody else can do, right? And I, I think what that means is that we're going to go there. We're going to meet the people there. Hopefully, we'll meet Takashima-san, right? He's the mayor. I think he's been the mayor since he was 36 years old. He's now 42 wow. or 43. I don't remember, but that's young in Japan. He's a young guy in Japan, yeah, exactly. Really young in Japan. And for those of you that haven't been to Fukuoka, right, it's right at the top of Kyushu. It's part of like a big ken that's there. Hakata really is the name of the city. But what they're doing there is really it's really impressive right i think we mentioned last week that they're trying to change the way people look at japan as a place to do startups right so what's been hard people always talk you know i live in bangkok and people always talk about southeast asia it's hard to get stuff done here right like it's not friendly to foreigners which we can argue about that later right we can talk mm -hmm. about it um, because i don't necessarily agree with that but japan historically has been very difficult for foreigners all the way back to um you know, Admiral Perry and the black ships that landed mm. 
can't believe we got there already. But all that <laughs> stuff, it's, it's just been historically very hard, right, for foreigners to succeed and to get into Japan. And I think what Fukuoka has said is, look, there's a startup revolution going on in the world. Let's have that revolution um, start here in Japan. And I, and I think if you if you go into Tokyo, you'll find, again, we talked about this a little bit last week, there are so many other kind of alternative places to work, whether it's yeah. insurance or finance or Toyota or manufacturing and all these, you know, engineering companies there. It's hard to get people's attention, but if you're in Fukuoka, maybe there's not as much industry there. You've got to go to, you know, a little bit further north into Aichiken where Toyota's based. But the point is that they're building a an entire ecosystem down there. Foreigners are there, Japanese people are there, and like I said, you've got a young mayor there who's giving people visas. Right, so right. very similar to what you do in 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 Thailand, and we'll get to Bangkok later in, in the show. Um, but you know, giving foreigners visas, visas. If you hire a couple of Japanese people, if you invest a certain amount of money in this country, we'll let you stay here for two years or three years or however long it is. And I bet you're seeing a lot more foreigners graduate from their sort of study abroad programs and say, "I like it here." Yeah. I don't want to necessarily live in like the biggest city in the world. I mean, Tokyo is not the biggest, but it's probably in the top 10. But I do want to live in a city. And, you know, the great thing about Fukuoka is it's like close to the ocean, but close to the mountains. It's near hot springs. There's a lot of stuff you can do there. And because it's not Tokyo, maybe the focus isn't on you so much. Mm. But boy, you have access to the entire Japanese market. And with the sort of concessions that the government there is making – you know, we don't know. We're going to go. We're going to find out, right? Right. right. I mean, isn't that the whole point? Right. So I'm exactly. looking. Exactly. I, I want to find out what Tom Brook is up to. I really want to know what Curate does. I want to talk to him face to face and find out what that means, right? I want to talk to Kuaharasan and find out what is Do Re mean. That's like a great. That's like a great Japanese name for a company. It's kind of English, so kind of not English. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a gerund, but not really a gerund. This is the kind of thing I want to find out. Yeah. But I also want to go like there's a golf company that's being built there. There's a whole bunch of stuff, even right. venture capital, right? So I want to go down there and talk to these people. I want I want them to become part of our community. I want them to become part of this sort of regional sort of Asian startup community. And I want to give Fukuoka a way to connect mm. not just to Southeast Asia, to the rest of the world. But the, the only way to do that is to do what? Uh-huh. That's to go there and meet you these people. There. You can't do it online, can you? You got to go meet face to face, and the whole thing's it's just an interesting experiment, isn't it? I mean, experiment is the word really here, isn't it? I know yeah. that's sort of yeah. it's such a lean startup thing, but what they're doing out there, and as you explained in the introduction, the geography of Fukuoka is kind of important as well. I mean, it's Very. kind of closer. I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody can put us in the right position here, but I think it's closer to Korea than it is to Tokyo, right? So, well, if you go to the southwestern part of um, Kyushu, it's definitely closer to right. Asia than it so, is to Tokyo for sure. So, mentality-wise, there's a bit of that, isn't there? Because they're so far away from the capital, it's a challenger brand, so to speak. If you think about all these cities, they have to kind of get out there and they have to kind of set out their stall and attract entrepreneurs and talent, they're the challenger brand, right? Yeah, and look, to be fair, I sat with somebody, after you and I started talking about this at the end of last week's broadcast, I sat with a few people this week and I said, look, I'm thinking about going to Fukuoka to do, and they were like, what? Wow. And I know I want that to be the last time I hear that as the answer <laughs> to that question. Were they surprised? He, well, they didn't know what it was. Right, so. okay. They'd never heard of it. They'd never heard of it. And, wow. you know, if I'd said Tokyo, they would have heard of that. And maybe yeah, if I had said, like, Nagasaki, they would have heard of that. But for all the wrong reasons, Hiroshima, maybe because of the atomic bombs. But still, you know, Fukuoka is a big, vibrant city. Yeah. And, you know, again, most people don't know this, but around the rivers that are there that sort of cut through the city, there's a great little area, right, where, you know, there are great restaurants and great bars and all this other kind of stuff. But it should be a great place for young people to settle outside of Tokyo, but still has some city, great food. Mm. And like I said, great access to beaches and stuff like that, but still close to Asia too. Right. So for my money, I want to go there and see why are these people, you know, why does Hashimoto-san start new lab in Kyushu? Why is he in Fukuoka? Is he from there? And even if he is, why didn't he go to Tokyo? 
Mm-hmm. Right. And why are the foreigners there? And I think this is the, this is the thing that we want to answer when we go to all of the cities, right? So here's the idea. The idea is, I don't know, take six weeks. Yep. Take uh, eight weeks, but let's go on the road. Right. And let's ask everybody that's listening as well. Are you in Fukuoka? Contact us. Let us know what's going on there. Let us know the right place to broadcast. Let us know the best co-working spaces, the best coffee shops, the best, you know, Mexican restaurants. What is Let it that know. you mentioned Mexican restaurants last time? You got to think for them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Mexican restaurants in Fukuoka, you really are going long, aren't you? I'm taking you there. <laughs> I'm taking you there. You know what? I'll put you. You know what? I'll put you this way. Go All right, ahead. go go on. Do, put it this way first. No, let me put you this way. There is a there's a Mexican. And I keep saying this because I want to talk about it. There's a Mexican restaurant in Fukuoka that's out of this world. Why is that? It's because the woman that founded it, her father, I believe. Right, so the grandfather of the daughters, yeah, but the woman who founded it, her father was the ambassador to Mexico. She was born in Mexico. Uh, okay. This is like Mexican food. Authentic. She, I, very, she was born there. She grew up in Mexican food. Like I believe her daughters were born there as well. And I was sitting there once years ago, and I said, I came back here from Tokyo just for the tacos. She got mad. <laughs> No, she got really mad. And if anybody's in Fukuoka, they'll know exactly who I'm talking about. She was like, she's like, this is not a taco restaurant. Oh, wow. This is Mexican food. So when I slap like, your wrist, Michael. <laughs> um, but I want to be able to know as much about the startup scene there as I know yeah. about the food scene. Hey, you know, right? you made a really interesting point off air. And I want to share that with the listeners because I think it's so important. And I'd never really thought of this myself, but the way you put it made sense and it kind of puts everything we're doing in, into context here. Tell me. You said about, you know, if everything was based on what it should be on paper, and I'm sort of paraphrasing it, what you said. Right? Yep. If everything was based based on what it should be on paper, so, you know, the big city, where the money is, then the startup scene in America would be in New York, but it ain't. Yeah. It's out in California, no. which is like geographically as far from New York as you can get, right? Southwest yep. California sort of thing, you know, LA or San Francisco. So, you know, something's going on there. And I know there's a lot being written about what makes startup scenes, startup scenes, but we won't sort of go into that, but there's kind of like a general theme here is that there's something going on. We're not talking about necessarily the obvious candidates for where the money is, right? We're talking about where the startup innovation and entrepreneurs are, right? Yeah. I mean, look, we can talk about the U S for a second. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting point, right? You could say that it should be on the East coast of the United States. That's where the oldest educational institutions are and they're highly concentrated, right? So Boston used to have like Lotus one, two, three was started in Boston. Um, you have EMC, right? Was started in Boston. That's because they had this thing called the tech, the information highway was route 128, which is into Boston. Right. And I know that because my family's from Boston, but Boston also has MIT. It has Harvard. Right, it's close enough. That whole area is close enough to Yale, but there's Tufts, there's Brandeis, all these great universities, and that's normally the thing that people talk about when they talk about San Francisco, right? So it's near Stanford, it's near Berkeley, um, you know, Xerox is there. So the Park Lab that used to be part of Xerox, but it's now independent, was there. So that's why all that stuff started up. But frankly, if it was just a money thing, and if it was just like the biggest city thing, it would be in New York, and you would never, you'd never have the massive and really vibrant community you have in Austin, Texas. Now, I know Dell was based there, but it's the same thing. There's no reason why some kid who um, who like went to college and even Kyoto goes down to Fukuoka after school and says, I'm starting a business here. My family's from Kyushu. There's, there are technical universities there as well. And it's a better lifestyle right. than it is in Tokyo. That's the cool, weather's better. That's- that's it's key, super right? core to this. It is key right, to this, right? It's a conscious and that's, choice. Yeah. They don't have to be in Tokyo to do it. And frankly, maybe there are too many distractions in Tokyo. Right. right? Like, what do you do for a big night out in Malpitas, California? Yeah. Do you know, like, I don't, I, I don't know. And what do you do in these small towns? Like, sure, there are some great universities there. But there are a lot of tiny towns in, in that part of California surrounding San Francisco where a lot of these startups were – and maybe that's why they started in a garage, or maybe that's why the you know there's that myth of Hewlett and Packard sitting in a garage somewhere, and the Apple right. guys going, we can do the same thing too. But there's no reason why you can't start in a garage in Japan. Um, and Fukuoka could be the perfect place to do this because it's central enough in the entire country 
and close enough to Asia where it can be like a gateway to a great, a great uh, part of innovation. And the fact that the mayor of that city who, uh, who gets that is, is really, it makes it really interesting, right? Because again, he doesn't necessarily have to toe the line for Nomura Securities or any of the big securities com- security companies that are in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. He can pretty much do whatever he wants. And if the government in Tokyo, the national government says, hey, what are you doing down there? He can just say, look, it's small. Leave us alone. We'll figure it out. And by the time he's done building something, it's too late. Right. Right. So I think it's a great place for us to start. Um, you're in Japan, right? So it's a natural place for, for us to go. Mm-hmm. Um I've lived in Japan, so it'll be really interesting to see what the reaction is there and, and the type of support we can get. It's a great jumping off point because, again, it's a little bit, I don't want to say ignored, but it's just not as well known as it should be. Right, right. But that's a good recipe for why it might make a great startup city, right? Absolutely, because to try no harder. one's paying attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, one's paying, no one's paying enough attention. Like if you tried to build a startup in Tokyo, again, right. the distractions, the other opportunities – Maybe your family, particularly if your family's from Tokyo, would yeah, say yeah. to you something like, why wouldn't you just go work at No More yeah. If you really want to do fintech, why not, if you're a technologist, why not get a full-time exactly. job? Take the, you know, semi and $100,000 a year salary and make yep. your mother proud. Yep. Exactly. Right? But instead, these, these guys and gals are going down to Kyushu and saying, I want to do it here. It's, again, it's a better lifestyle, right? Yeah. We talked about this all, last week. You can go to Singapore and start a fintech company. You can start the same thing in Indonesia where there are 270 million people, right? And that's why Jakarta is going to end up being a super hotbed for what's going on in the fintech world because, frankly, just the pure number of customers that are available Mm. means that that's going to be a big deal. Mm. Right. So we're not going to – go ahead. No, it's just going to be interesting, isn't it? I mean, when we get down to Fukuoka, just what kind of people are down there, right? You know, yeah. are, they, are they people who are locals? Are they people who have made a conscious choice to move there? Are they, like you mentioned, I mean, the English teacher who thought they would stick around for a bit and started up his own company in Fukuoka? I don't know. We're only going yeah. to know by finding out and getting it down there, right? So people who yeah, made a conscious either. choice, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I can't wait to get there, though, and find out. Yeah. Like I said, I've been to Fukuoka a bunch of times, and none of it was ever for business. So yeah. it'll actually be really fun for me to see like what's going on there from a business perspective. And that that's exciting to me. Awesome. Yeah. We so, will be the first Asian technology podcast to visit Fukuoka. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. And I hope that everybody – and I hope that everybody – um that's there can come out to support us. Like the, be- yeah. the, the best thing that can come out of this is to have enough connectivity so we can connect them to what's going on in the rest of, in the rest of Asia, at least, if nothing else, right? Because yeah. one of the things that I've seen, and we can talk about other parts of, um, of Japan as well, but one of the things that I've seen about the Japanese startup scene, and we, you can ask the venture capitalists there, is that kind of like Vietnam, and we'll get to Vietnam in a second, mm. it's, um, it's very domestic. Yes. You know, again, because the market there is so big, that they don't necessarily look outward, but I believe that Fukuoka is going to start to do different things, right? So if you look at just the homepage of Startup City Fukuoka, they have something called Global Center. I really believe what they want to do is they want to build global businesses that start here and put this city on the map, and nothing would make me happier than being able to help them do that. Mm. So that's, that's the goal of going there. Right, and I frankly I can't wait to do that. So when when do you want to do that? End of August. Let's do it. Let's I'm do there. It. I've got no, the thing is I've got no expectations, Mark. We, we could get there, and it could just be tumbleweed. crickets. It could be crickets. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it could exactly. be. But you yeah. know we're not going to know until we go. So we're putting ourselves out on the limb. We're kind of nailing our colours on the mast a little bit here by saying pretty much. But hey, that's how we sort of roll. So let's go. Yeah, and see, I mean, look. Right? You've, you've got to do what you say works. And I really strongly believe that no one's ever achieved anything without taking some risks. Yeah. Right. And we talked about it offline and we should talk about it online. We could show up there. Look, I guarantee you it's not going to be like the Beatles showing up in uh, at JFK. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there are probably going to be a lot fewer people and a lot more, a lot fewer screaming people, except maybe please leave. But having said that, we will still go there and, I'm pretty sure that after 
couple of days of trying to figure out what we're going to do. We'll figure it out there and we'll get some really decent support there. I, I can feel it already. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Right. Yeah. So if Fukuoka. we think about, yeah, Fukuoka, what do you think? August, what? We want to keep it on Tuesdays, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that last Tuesday in August would be ideal, right? Yeah. I'm looking at August 29th. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. And all we really need is a couple of people to help support it and a yep. place to sit with a few microphones and a little bit of like good acoustics and yeah, yeah. You know, as many as many people can sit there as possibly can. So if you have you know, a people, co-working space in Fukuoka, then tap us up, hit us up, contact us, AG Tech Podcast. Let us know. We'll, we will bring people to your co-working space and give you exposure. We'll bring in the startups and all the other people from the ecosystem. Because ideally, right, if we do this right, we'd like to actually show up, and we'll talk about the other cities where we're going to go, but we'd like to show up a day early. Yeah. Meet, meet some people from the ecosystem, whether it's founders, investors, high net worth individuals, or even the you know government people that are supporting the tech ecosystem in these spaces, and definitely co- co-working space owners, right? Because a co-working space is a place where startups should be gathering. Yeah. Right. And in, in a city that where you and I are not familiar necessarily, while we can do research, it's always great to have somebody there kind of put us in the right place and tell us where the right place to go so we can get the best exposure. So hopefully we can do that on the Monday. Tuesday, we'll get together with all the people we've already met and we'll broadcast live from there and have a similar conversation, not just about the people that we've met, but about the things that we've learned and the feeling that we get, I think, from being in that city. Yeah. Right. So going with an open mind for sure. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd take some questions as well. We could do a live event, take questions from people, talk about our feelings. You know, I think, you know, that's maybe what doesn't come across from articles about these places, right? We could talk about our feelings, what we've seen, our experiences, and get people to come along and just be part of that whole journey, right? Share with us their experiences, so their stories. Yeah. I mean, look, the greatest thing... I always used to say this when I was a tourist traveling around, right? So your first time in a country, the best thing that can possibly happen to you is run into a local, right? Who takes you into his house and serves you the local tea. Yeah. Right? Because then you're really learning about what it's like to be in whatever locale that you've traveled to, right? And that's the, that's the key thing. And this has happened to me in a bunch of different places. You're just walking around neighborhoods because anybody can go see a tourist attraction. But what you really want to do is get a feel for that spot. And this yeah. is what we hope to do. Um, on August 29th in Fukuoka. Yeah. Love it. Genuine Japanese tacos. <laughs> it, the, the reason to go there, I mean, sure, when you're in Japan, you want to get Japanese food, but the reason to go there is just to show that like, maybe what you expect to see when you yeah. go to a place is not exactly what you're go- going to see. Yep. And I think that's kind of the best thing about going to a new place. So we'll do that in Fukuoka for sure. If you've never been there, We'll show you some places that uh, are pretty interesting. It definitely has a different vibe than Tokyo. Um, yeah, yeah. And I guess and I'm if, really, if everyone wants to come and visit Fukuoka whilst we're there, then they're more than welcome to come and join yeah, us. Yeah, please join us. I mean, anybody can join us, I, frankly, in any place that we're going to go. Yeah. So where are we going next? Fukuoka is a good starting point. What's on the agenda next? Where do you want to well, go? Well, I want to go, like I said, I have not been in Vietnam since 1991. Wow. And... To a certain extent, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that that's a long time away from <laughs> Vietnam, and a lot has changed. Yeah, I mean, what's it, 26 years ago? Yeah, yeah. It's not, I mean, to say it's not even the same place is really, it's, uh, it's you know, it's not even close to how much things have changed there, right? If you look at where I, when I went to Vietnam and when I was in Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, right. like, there was literally nothing there. I imagine Nothing. the early 90s. I mean, I was in Southeast Asia in the early 90s, and it was, yeah, I mean, very different. Well, remember, back then, Americans couldn't travel to Vietnam. Right, okay. So How did it was you get really, in then? Well, so we came from Tokyo, right, because I was living in Tokyo at the time, and they didn't stamp our passport. Ah. So I went there with two other Americans. Both of us, All three of us were working at Morgan Stanley at the time. And when we entered the country, they basically – taped a piece of paper into our passport, stapled, no, not paste it, stapled it, right? <laughs> stamped that. And then when we left, they just Rip took out. it away. <laughs> they just took it away. So getting back into Japan was actually quite interesting. Where were you? Vietnam. Sure. Where's your stamp? 
Um, but anyway, so in the, in the ensuing, t- and it's really embarrassing for me that I haven't been back because I don't know for sure. I'm kind of just making this up, but the flight from Bangkok to Ho Chi Minh, what is it? An hour? Yeah. An it's hour one, and a half. It's one of those things, isn't it? Because it is just an hour. It's always there. Yeah. I mean, I've been here for six years and uh, you know, every year I just say, oh sure, this is the year I'm going to go to Vietnam. And when, you know, when I was there. So think about this. We drove, we drove from Ho Chi Minh City up to Hue. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that at some level. We 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 drove to Da Nang and to Hue and all these places, and then we flew up to Hanoi, and then actually we drove from Hanoi. Am I getting this right? To How Long Bay, which was a three-hour yeah. drive. I can't remember actually back in the day. But like when you know highways, there were no highways. It was like oh. the first time I was in Thailand back in um, 1998. I drove from here from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. Right. Wow. And there were no highways. That was just insane. But anyway, so Ho Chi Minh, I think, is the next place to go. And again, if nothing else, because I'm about as familiar with Ho Chi Minh City um, as I am with the startup scene in Fukuoka. Now, I know people that live there, right? So I, you know, I have uh, my friend Bobby Lu lives there, and, you know, Bobby's involved in Topica and the Founders Institute and a whole bunch of stuff there. So I think we could have good hosting when we're there. And there are tons of startups there, no, right? For sure. Tons. I mean, look, Vina Games is one of the biggest startups that ever, that's ever come out of Southeast Asia. It's a very right? distinct startup scene, though, isn't it? I mean, as you say, like games is one key part of that. Yep. Yep. And if you think that just from a GDP per capita standpoint, right? So I, I like to talk about market gaps, right? What's necessary. So Vietnam, again, is a country of what, 90 million people. And if you think about the gaps in the market that need to get filled just to modernize businesses there, there is a massive opportunity. And if you look at sort of, I, I think I read a statistic a couple of days ago that said that Vietnamese universities and sort of technical schools are turning out 100,000 engineers a year, Wow! which means that the engineering quality is high mm. and it's also voluminous, which means that there are tons of people there that can code. Yes. But Vietnam, at least up until now, is really famous for kind of its design. So UI design, UX design, and its coding, um, its coding strength. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I know what I read, right? And I know what I hear. And while I do have friends that live there, and actually, one of my buddies that I used to trade with, so a guy who used to work at, he'll hate me for saying this, but a guy who used to work at Barclays Global Investors, um, and who also went to like a really fancy private school in New York for high school is now living in Ho Chi Minh and investing in startups there. And he and I speak periodically. We can reconnect with him as well. Mm. Um, and I think that'll come in really handy. But again, I haven't been there in 25 years. I don't know when the last time was you were in Vietnam. But Ho Chi Minh seems to me to be another great place to go. And it's kind of going up the curve of places that are close, that are growing, but maybe that most people outside of the region don't really know. Mm. Um, has such a vibrant startup community. And we talked about it last week, but the question is, what really does make that a great startup city? And hopefully we can get, again, the people there to come and support and help us figure out where should we broadcast? Who yeah. are the best part? Who are the best partners there? I right? Love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was in Vietnam. I was in Ho Chi Minh two years ago. Okay. I landed on the Forgive me if I get this wrong, but the Vietnamese Independence Day or whatever it was. So I timed that wrong. So everybody that I was uh, <laughs> hoping to meet was off. You know, they all go back to their family homes and stuff. Yeah, but fair enough. I think, you know, interesting. I don't know. It's a sort of a, a sweeping generalization. But, you know, my thoughts on Vietnam, well, Ho Chi Minh particularly, compared to, say, Bangkok, which we'll come to in a minute, is that it seems like Vietnam, I mean, Ho Chi Minh's a big city. It seems yeah. to service itself a lot. It seems that it's less... I mean, you can walk around Ho Chi Minh and you see a lot less English than you would say walking around Bangkok, right? So there's that off the bat. There's a difference there. So Bangkok is much more geared towards foreigners. So that's one thing. And it seems that... I don't know if the English levels are different or whatever, but it seems like the Vietnamese community is probably geared a little bit differently to say the, the Thai community when it comes to startups. So we'll see a little different flavor. You know, they say, if we're talking about people who are an engineering basis based people who are sort of building design, building databases, building games, that kind of thing, maybe they're sort of more of an outsource community. I don't know. 
people who are sort yes. of working with startups, you know, like game development houses as opposed to people exporting apps, right? Yeah, but again, we don't know, right? And so right. the best thing to do is go. go there, sit in the middle of it, and have people tell us we're, we're wrong. Like, I, I don't mind being wrong. <laughs> I always say I don't have a monopoly on the right idea, and I love going to a place and finding out, you know, right or wrong. I just like finding out new stuff. Yeah. Right, and that's definitely going to happen there. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, it certainly is a market that's coming along, right? I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, the the figures that you just rolled out, 90 million. Wow. You know, you think about that compared, that's bigger than Germany in Europe, right? It's bigger than the UK. Exactly. One and a half times bigger than the UK. So, you know, it's a huge <laughs> market and it's, it's, you know, it's got a burgeoning middle class as well. Well, and that's it, the thing It's too, got the work right? ethic as well. I mean, maybe different to some of the countries in the region, right? It's got the work ethic. It's a generalization. Yeah. I'm going to get kicked for that, but that's a generalization. Yeah, but again, that's the reason to go, right? Right. And that's the whole point of this tour is, you know, we think we know what's going on there. And, and frankly, people that sit outside the region think they know what's going on there too. Yeah. And they have no idea. And prove the only way to do it is to, yeah, pro prove us wrong. I want to be wrong, right? So come and tell me what I, what I don't know and what I need to know. Come show me the people that I haven't met yet that I need to meet. Come sit with us and ask us questions about where we've come from and why we're there, why we love to go to new places and, and broadcast the way we do, because that type of stuff actually ends up being quite important. And that's part, of the, that's part of the goal of this whole thing is really to go out, meet the great cities, the great startup cities in, in Asia. It's not even just Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a chance, there's a chance we may, you know, change our schedule along the way as people contact us and say, hey, how come you're not coming to my city? Yeah, we're getting that already, aren't we? We are. <laughs> what, what are we going to say to those people? Because we don't want to disappoint people. But, you know, we can't no, sort of well, 52 weeks we on the road. Everything. We've got families. <laughs> yeah, we can't do everything. Um, but we'll do as much as we can. And frankly, if there's a compelling reason to go someplace, yeah, exactly. we'll go. Yeah. We'll go. Right. So what's another place that very few people know that much about, but it's going to have a huge impact over the next five to ten years? And I think that's Myanmar. Oh, Yeah. I'm just so right. excited about, I mean, when you say the word Myanmar, I mean, Burma to those who are yep. not up with the change, but wow, you know, the history, everything, it just excites me. It tingles me. It does, right? And so I like to say I've never been there, yeah. but, but, but theoretically that's not true, right? So in 1998, like I said, I drove from Bangkok up to Chiang Mai, then drove to Chiang Rai, and then drove to the border of Myanmar. And this is when Myanmar was in, let's just say, very difficult shape, run by a military government. And it wasn't really friendly with anybody in the world. It wasn't even that it was just unfriendly with its border mates, right? With Laos and with um, and with Thailand. It really wasn't friendly with anybody. It was pretty much closed off to the rest of the world. And there was this tiny little bridge you could walk across that connected Thailand <laughs> to what was then <laughs> Myanmar, Burma. Like it, you didn't really know. And I remember walking like to the edge and just thinking, do I really want to do this? <laughs> right? Do I really want to go into a place where like, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I get there. And I won't forget, right? Because the border guards literally took your passport and they kept it. Oh dear. Yeah. So it made me very uncomfortable, right? No stamp, no nothing. They just kind of looked at your passport, looked at you, looked at your passport, looked at you. And I didn't even know back then. Like, did it benefit me to be an American citizen? Was it better not to be an American citizen? <laughs> I don't have, I didn't have a choice, but the, the question really was like, did I want to be in a country that was unfriendly to everybody without my passport? Cause I had to give it to the border guy, you know, and those guys were standing there with automatic weapons as well. Anyway, the weird thing was you'd walk over and they let you kind of walk around this little part of town. Uh -huh. It was supposed to be, what's it called? Like the model part of the town? Right. You know, where you want, this is the show, show foreigners. foreigners. Right. We're not paupers, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've like got Coca-Cola, yeah. okay? Kind of thing. <laughs> and I remember walking across and you, there was like a convenience store. It wasn't a 7-Eleven. You know, maybe it was a 610. I, you know what I mean? It was like a convenience store. I have yeah. no idea what it was called. And it had pretty bare shelves, but it did have Coke. And maybe it had like some cup of noodles or something. I don't remember what was there, but that was their way of saying, look, what you read in the news is not correct. <laughs> this is a vibrant, well-developed society, you know, run by a friendly government and just leave us alone and please go back over the river. And uh, Was it worth it? Were you happy? Was that 
everything you expected it to be? I don't think I'd Obama. ever. I don't think in that point, up until that point, I'd ever been that afraid. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's it more was a comment military on junta, though, at the time, right? It was. I mean, it's only recently oh, become a democracy, quote unquote. But back then, it was a yeah. military dictatorship, right? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I'm not sure if that says a, so much about the country as it says about just my stupid fear for not understanding like what was right. going on in a country that wasn't, you know, well known to me. But we're but going fair, back on different terms now. Well, we're going back on completely different terms, and that's the thing too, right? Like there are people in Yangon that podcast. Yeah. There are foreigners that live there that are venture capitalists. There are locals that are venture capitalists. And, you know, every society sends people outside. You know, the Japanese did this in the 1700s and the 1800s. You know, go to Germany, learn to be a doctor. Go to the UK and learn how to speak English. And, you know, the people in Myanmar are just as curious about the rest of the world in this generation as every other country in the world has been – that's been kind of closed off and just not connected to the rest of the world. And they're just as curious as any other humans. And the great thing is, is that as soon as they get a chance, right, again, just like with every other country in the world, as soon as they get a chance and have the resources to it, they like to travel, find out what the rest of the world is like yeah. and bring back best practices. And I want to see how that's developing as well. Right, I because I know. Jim, sorry, I just I saw Jim Rogers, Jim Rogers. Yeah, talking about Myanmar. He says he reckons Myanmar is the next Thailand. He thinks he's big yeah, on I Myanmar, mean, right? I mean, what what are your thoughts? Do you think it's it's overhyped? I mean, it's so much talk about Myanmar the last couple of years. Oh, oh you just did it to me again. I always say I'm going to look this up, and I can never remember. It. But there is a very sophisticated term for the hype cycle. <laughs> remember, we talked about this before. Oh yeah. Um, and I think a year or so ago, you were at the top of the hike, the hype cycle for acquiring real estate and hotels in Yangon and in the rest of sort of well-developed, um, better developed Myanmar. Uh -huh. And to be fair, it's on, it's on the west coast of Thailand as well. So it's out on the, on, on the Andaman Sea and a little bit further north, which means that the beaches there are like some of the few left untouched beaches in the world. Mm. and by all um, accounts are gorgeous. Wow. So you're going to see tourism, I think, explode. And I think in the way that most of the, most of the countries in the world develop, once the tourists go, they'll bring back stories about how beautiful it is. Some yeah. of the tourists will stay and they'll build businesses there. You know, People will stay there and marry a local, and then their families will come back, and it just gets integrated into the rest of the world. And I don't think Myanmar is going to be any different. And I don't think that's a process actually that can be reversed, right? So once you join sort of the community of nations, mm. you, you can argue, you know, you and I try not to talk so much about politics on this show, but you can argue that, you know, this whole concept of internationalization is hitting a speed bump. And you see it all over Europe and you see it in the United States as well. And yet once that process starts, mm. particularly with the, you know, that thing, the internet thing, <laughs> mm. And allowing instantaneous communication in a way that's frictionless and global, you just can't stop it. Mm. Right? There are too many benefits for people being connected as opposed to being disconnected. And while we may have some sort of short-term fluctuations in people's opinions about that, I don't think that's going to go away. And what that means is that Yangon and the rest of Myanmar is going to continue to get more and more connected to the rest of the world. And because there is a startup revolution going on globally, again, market gaps – just consider what the market gaps are like in a country like that that's been relatively close off to the rest of the world. Um, and that's not an opinion, right? That's just a fact. Mm. And I want to go there and see, right, because imagine building a mobile phone company from, from scratch in a place where there have been no landlines anyway. Right? So, you know, like in the U.S., there are probably two landlines for every house. In Japan, there are landlines everywhere. Right? So building a mobile business was difficult at first. But in a country like Myanmar, very similar to a country like Thailand and also in the rest of the region, you have people's first access to the internet is mobile. Yeah. And it creates a completely different experience, right? whether it's mobile banking or mobile insurance or mobile car purchasing or mobile real estate rental or everything is going to be on a mobile device. You know, we call them mobile phones, but really they're just – pocket computers, really high-powered supercomputers you put in your pocket. And I think going there and finding out what people's view is on how their tech ecosystem is going to develop, it's going to be really interesting. We talk a lot on this podcast about how 
in this region, we can see the future because we can see a lot of things that are getting developed in the West and then kind of applied to here. But Myanmar is one of those places where, because it's really just starting to catch up in leaps and bounds, and leap is the best word because it could be leapfrogging what's going yeah. on in the rest of the world. To me, it could be one of the most fascinating places that we visit. And just going there, I'm, I can all, I'm already excited. Oh, yeah. And, and I think that the people there, you know, they'll be excited. Not that we're there necessarily, but they'll just be excited to share. Look, we talked about this earlier, right? I think – you can talk about interviewing people, and I think it's more likely just listening to their story. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the key, really, when you go talk to someone. It's, you're not asking them questions necessarily. You're just using those questions as a guide to get to what those people's story are. And I think, frankly, the story in, um, in Yangon is going to be really interesting. It's and that's not to minimize what's – yeah, it's not going to minimize what's going on in Fukuoka and what's going on in Ho Chi Minh. But – those are better known in relative terms than what's going yeah. on in Myanmar. And that, to me, is fascinating. Again, I've never been to that part of Myanmar. So that should be really exciting, too. And then when that's done, right? So those are three places that we really don't know that much about. We haven't really been. And then from there, What's you know, I want, to take, I want to take you to my hometown. Bangkok. And Bangkok. Now, in Bangkok, the tech startup scene is just on fire. Right, right. Right, okay, just before we go into that. Go ahead. For anybody that hasn't been to Bangkok in a while or has never been to Bangkok, that would be news, right? Because most people don't even know that Bangkok is a tech hub. They can't imagine it, right? So, no, if you've never been outside the region. So, I just want to put that in there because people are thinking, what? Are you sure? Is it on fire? What right. do you mean on fire? Right. So, I say it like it's obvious because to you and to me, it's pretty obvious. And, and again, you know, everything's obvious if, if you live in the midst of it. Um, but I will say this, okay? <laughs> and again, I'm never sure if it's a comment on the individual that I'm talking about or, or the subject. But I remember when I was going to Japan, and that was, you know, 30 years ago or 25 years ago for school, yeah? And my cousin asked me, like, are, do they, are they still carrying swords? And uh, yeah. you know, they have their hair tied like samurai. Yep. And, <laughs> And I think the impressions of people who haven't been to Bangkok are potentially, you know, driven by yeah. silly things they see in movies without mentioning the movies that show the silly things. And I think that they're comp – and again, it's an edge for me that they're wrong. Yeah. Right. And they're just wildly wrong. Right. So if you go down the main street in Bangkok, it's just like – it's insane. Right. It's just insanely, you know – High, high level shopping, high level people, fancy cars. Like it's really just a place like you wouldn't believe. And frankly, my first time in Bangkok was the same time. I think it was the first, yeah, like I said, it was 1998. So almost 20 years ago. Hmm. And it's just like a different place. Right. And, and if you come here from Tokyo to Bangkok, so it's, you know, you've made a conscious change as well. It's not like you've moved from rural America to Bangkok, you've moved from the biggest city in the world to pro probably one of the second biggest cities in the world. Right. So yeah. And happy and happy to have done it to be fair. Yeah. Right. I mean, and again, just because the opportunities that we see here and the vibrancy that we see in the startup community is just massive and it's, it manifests itself. You know, you, we, you and I talked about this, right. It manifests itself in every part of the ecosystem. No. In other words, it's investors, it's venture capitalists, it's co-working spaces, which I can name, you know, four or five off the top of my head, um, and startups. And you run an entire, you know, whether it's all the stuff that's built by Arden Capital or all the other companies that are built here, you know, whether it's the Uden or all the people that I talk to on a daily basis, what's going on here is nothing short of insane. And, you know, we're having a massive conference. We have probably two or three very large conferences here every year, mm -hmm. if not more sub-conferences. There's just so much going on if you've not been to Bangkok. people, The people that are listening that know, you know, right now they're just shrugging their shoulders like, what are you talking about? But the people that don't know are doing the same thing in reverse, like, what are you talking about? It cannot be like that. But we'll, we'll expose that more when you come here and you'll see. We'll go to the co-working spaces. We'll talk to some of the startup people here and then we'll broadcast live face to face. And I think that'll be a fascinating story too. If for no other reason, then you'll, it'll be your introduction here, yeah, yeah. which I think will be really, really I'm interesting. Right? Looking forward to that. So well, what about the people? Cause I mean, you know, if you were to compare, I, I don't want to sort of 
get you into trouble here. So we're just trying to dance around the subject a little bit here, but <laughs> I'm a terrible dancer. <laughs> well, let's, 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 let's just, okay. Let's just shoot from the hip. All right. So if you compare, say Bangkok and Tokyo, you've lived in both of these cities, you've worked in both of these cities. So you pretty much are qualified to talk about these cities, right? Now, both have co-working spaces, both have VC funds, both have events. They all have that. Both have the connectivity, everything. They check all the boxes. But people-wise, and this is a very sweeping generalization, but I'd like you to make a generalization just so you can get some angry comments on the Twitter for people who maybe object to what we're saying. But I just want to kind of provoke a reaction. But generalization, Bangkok, Tokyo, people startup entrepreneurs is there a difference yes so here's the reality the reality is that that japan for what it's worth is a very flat society right very flat at least in my mind what does that mean it means that you know there's a there's a massive massive middle class and while there are super super rich there's not the same amount of bifurcation. What that means is that, well, economic bifurcation. And what that means from my perspective is that from an opportunity perspective, if you are like, there's no better time. And I say this all the time. There's no better time to be like a Thai teenager or a Thai person like in your twenties. No better time in the history of Thailand except maybe two or three hundred years ago because there's just like unbridled opportunity mm. and it's everywhere. Right. So it must be what it was like in the United States in the fifties where like you never, there was no better time in the U S to be like a teenager or graduating from college where you just looked around and like you didn't have to be the Carnegie's or the Mellons or the Rockefellers to succeed. Cause prior to that, it probably was more like that. Right. Mm. And I see very, I see very many similarities mm. like that. And what's happened is because you have these two things coming together where you have very well-educated middle-class people, but now see a massive opportunity just to say, I don't necessarily have to go work for somebody, whether it's a big Thai company or a big multinational corporation. I can start something on my own. Mm. And that opportunity means that there's so much energy, so much energy here. And that's different, at least in my perspective, than what I saw. Now, remember, I left Japan and I left Tokyo. And I left a financial industry. It was crumbling in 2011, right? So my view on this is really different. I have been back and forth since, but the feeling and the vibe I get in Bangkok is that it's just opportunity everywhere. It's like, get out of my way. I'm picking this thing and I'm going to run with this as fast and as far as I can. And if that thing fails, I'm going to try again. How is that different to Tokyo? I mean, young teenagers growing up in Tokyo, what are they Remember, thinking? So they've had, they have other opportunities, right? Right. And I think what they're thinking is, you know, and remember, you have really strong, let's not, let's not sugarcoat this. You have very strong family structures and very conservative societies in both places. Yeah. Right. And it's hard to know that about Bangkok unless you're here. Right. Very conservative. And that's a good, that's a good comment. That's not a pejorative term, right? Japan is very similar in that sense, right? Very conservative. And yet a conservative Japanese person will not seize that opportunity if they see it because they're just scared. They've had 20 years of like very difficult or longer economic times mm. and they're scared. And if they can get a job or work in that job, I think they see that as a better opportunity. Whereas a Thai person who's graduating from university now just says, I, I, there's just so much opportunity Give it a go. and I could go work for someone maybe and learn something, but then go do my own thing. And that's why the startup thing here is just, it's like competitive in a friendly way. It's hard to explain, but this is a place where, and I'm sure this is true of Indonesia as well and Vietnam too, right? But I don't know it as viscerally as I know it here. It's the case here that there's this pie that's like relatively small, relatively, yeah, not small. And it's just, instead of people trying to take a piece of that pie, they're just trying to make the edges of the pie bigger. Mm. And it's a very different feeling for me. Whereas in Japan, it feels like, you know, the economy has reached its natural size and if you can take pieces out of it and innovate around that, that's good. But at least in Bangkok, it feels to me like, you know, there's a nice pie here, but we can make this thing bigger. Right. That's going to be interesting to see. Actually, I mean, on the, the qualitative side, that sort of, you know, comparison. I mean, I live here in Tokyo. What you're talking about, that sort of defensive mindset as opposed to that abundant mindset, you know, whether that actually exists, you know, when you actually get down to the coal face, the front line and talk to startup people whether people are actually thinking like that and, you know, how they go about and we'll, we'll do that. We'll go out and do these interviews and do these stories, Michael, and gather those stories and we'll learn 
you know, what kind of mindsets these people have in these different cities. That's going to be really interesting. Yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to feel what that really was. And remember, the other thing is that in 1997, there was an Asian financial crisis. That's what we call it, right? Um, you know, where currencies got beaten up by foreign speculators. And I think that the central banks in this region have actually learned a lot from that. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to let it happen again, which means that now the locals are much more in charge of the development of their own economies. And I think people feel that, right? So that's what I mean when I say there's been no better time. Like if you're mother or father had started a business back in and and they sort of suffered from what happened in the late 90s and early 2000s -hmm. you know you're sitting there and i think what you're saying is that's okay i've seen the struggle i'm going to overcome that struggle and i want to build something even bigger that's what i feel right now remember i'm not thai so i don't i don't know for sure but that's kind of what i feel and i feel like that is very different than what i felt when i was in tokyo yeah yeah, but you'll see that and, you know, hopefully you'll have some of the same opinion, but maybe some different opinions as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm looking forward to it. So that's Bangkok. Yep. And then two more places, at least for now. Yeah. Um, we have to, we have to go to Jakarta. It's the elephant in the room in some ways, just because, you know, again, just like in Bangkok, there are, there are logistical challenges there. We have to figure out like what makes that different. How hard is it really to get around? Like I haven't been in Jakarta in like three years, right? So I don't know if it's the same as it was, better or worse than it was three years ago. Um, and I do have friends there as well. And I know that those people, th- those guys and gals can help us set some stuff up, hopefully. Maybe we broadcast from one of their offices, but whatever it is, you know, we've got weeks and weeks to sort of organize this. We can get in front of them and say, tell us what's different about Jakarta. Besides the, because I want to know more than just, there are 270 million people here. It's going to be big. Yeah. But like, I'm not so interested in that. Right. I mean, it's, it is interesting to a certain extent, but like the reason why the U S economy is bigger than the European economy, even though the populations are both huge is different than just, there's right, a big right. population there. It's a cultural, right? There's, right. there's a lot of cultural, stuff structural, yeah. Yeah. historical, all these things matter. Right now I'm not Indonesian either. But I want to go there and I want people that are there to tell me this is why, um, you know, Alibaba may invest $500 million in Tokopedia. Yeah. I love Jakarta okay. as a city. I think it's going to be, it's a challenge. Uh, logistically, yeah. it's a challenge. Three hours getting around the city, but there's something about it. I don't know. I mean, maybe that is the sort of necessary ingredient to make uh, startups emerge, but there's something chaotic about Jakarta that other cities don't have in the region. I don't know what yeah. it is, but there's, there's a magic there. I mean, it's huge as a city. I don't know how it compares to the other cities in the region, but it's up there in the top three in terms of size, but just in terms of the chaos. But I mean that in a sort of, not necessarily a, a negative way. In a, but, no, in a great way, right? Right, right. I mean, it's a very, I and mean, here's the thing about Indonesia. It's a very young country. And I think yeah. it's it really, you know, when I was in the day when I was doing mobile research, an interesting stat emerged is that I think there were more fans of English Premier League soccer in Jakarta. <laughs> could be right on Twitter. Could be. On Twitter, could be. yeah. Than there were on in any other city in the world, including London, right? Or including London. London. It's right. highly possible, though, right? Right, because there's just so many young people, and you get that. I mean, you know, I mean, the sort of the images of Indonesia. You see the news, and you see sort of like the the orthodox images of Indonesia and all that kind of thing. But beyond that, there's a very young, vibrant youth culture there. And that's going to be interesting to see how that translates into startup. Because there, there is a gap between youth culture and startup culture, obviously. You know, they need a bit of structure to make it work. But it's just going to be interesting to see how that actually converts into viable startups, right? Yeah. So get this. The median age in Indonesia... Let me just get this right. Is what? Is 29.9 years old. That's the median, okay? Wow. How, how does that the compare me- to other countries? Well, the median age in Japan is almost 47. Wow. So I'm actually on the young side in Japan. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the median age in the United States is almost 38. Wow. Right. And let's just do the United Kingdom. Right. So the median age in the United Kingdom is 39. So it's a very young. And let's just do Thailand while we're, while we're just researching this. Right. So, so far in Thailand, 
35. So Indonesia is a very young country. Wow, that's, that's median, yeah. That's a big, I mean, even five years is huge, isn't it? Because it's like, you know. It's massive. Average. So you're going to have a lot of young people. To get it skewed that young, yeah. Right. And then you take it in the city as well. It's skewed even younger, I guess, right? Because the people who move to the city are young. They've all come from the, the kampungs, the villages. So Yeah, I want to do Malaysia too. Right. So the, uh, so Malaysia is about the same. They're both about 28 or 29 years old. Is that so? Right? Interesting. Yeah. But let's do this because the last place we're going to visit – and I think it's, a, I think it makes sense actually to do this because it's the most developed place in Southeast Asia, right? It's yeah. Singapore. Uh -huh. We have to go. It's the richest place. Well, richest. It's got the most concentration of, of money, right? Doesn't necessarily have the wealthiest people in the region, but the highest GDP per capita is there. And the median age is over 34 years old. Mm. So well older by six years than both Indonesia and, um, and Malaysia, right? And, and five years older than thailand so there's just so much room and so much vibrancy i think in these in these other cities but i think it's important because you know like we talked about last week singapore has all the government programs whether yep. it's through the ida the mda the nrf you know singapore is constantly trying to evolve what their ecosystem is because they're trying to move everything away necessarily from all the banking and stuff like that they have the you know they were the first asian city to have the big deep water port built there mm -hmm. um and, and people forget but like you know, at one point, Singapore was a mecca for manufacturing of electronic goods. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right? So, like, the first the first MP3 players came out of Indonesia for Creative Labs, I believe, was the company. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all been changed. So now they want to move it to startups. And they've been doing that both in fintech, in, in gaming. You know, I think Garena was out of Singapore. but and, and some of the media stuff, too. But I think it'll be interesting to go there and see the difference. We talked about it last week. But it seems to me that Singapore is, like, a startup nation it's a small nation but it's yeah. five and a half million people it's all in pretty much one place and it'll be interesting to see the vibe there that's how it's different from the rest of the cities that we visit in asia right now the wild card will be do we go to china in the end you know we haven't decided that yet but i think that's a completely different ecosystem but it may make sense to go we don't know yet right Right, so you've named those five cities without six, 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 six. Did we name six? Okay, so without yeah, sort did, of com sorry. committing to without setting this in stone, throw out a wild card. Name, name a city without committing us to go there, but just to kind of get people chattering. What, where else? Well, I mean, I, I mean, in outside of China. Yeah, I mean, I would go to Chiang Mai, right? Because Chiang there's a there's a sort of vibrant ecosystem up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I would go to Hanoi just to see what's happening there as well. Um, where else? I'd love to go to Shanghai or even to Shenzhen. I mean, remember, Shenzhen is a, like I said, it's a mecca for manufacturing, but there must yeah. be other things that are growing up around that as wealth gets made there and distributed there. I'd like to go to Hong Kong. People will get mad at me for this, but I think that in the, in the pantheon of great startup cities, that Hong Kong's going to be in the second tier in Southeast Asia. Yeah, yeah. And again, Especially not because it's cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, right? I mean, Hong Kong is yeah, the place, yeah, right? Yeah. And again, not because it's a, it's a bad place, but because there's just so much other stuff to do there. Yeah. Right? What, what, what do you think about all this sort of the, well, what would in the old world be called Indochina, Phnom Penh, Luang Prang, all that sort of Vientiane, all those kind of, do, do they, Laos, Cambodia, are they on the, the, are they too early? Is it too early for that stuff right now? So it's, it's a little early, right? I've been to Vientiane, but only like for a day. I've never been to Luang Prabang which I probably mispronounced, so I'm sorry. And Phnom Penh, I haven't been to, although I've been to Siam Reap, but again, 20 years ago, so I don't really know anything about what's going on in Cambodia. Right. But you, I think it's early in those places. And that's an I think. If I'm wrong, tell me. Yeah, yeah, we want like, to Just strafe, strafe me online. Like I said, I have an opinion, but I don't have a monopoly on the right opinion. So tell me I'm wrong and tell me why. And give me a good reason to come there and learn because I'd love to have an excuse. Nothing would make me happier than, you know, to get on a plane and end up in Phnom Penh, a place I've never been. Mm. right so again i won't commit to it necessarily but i'd be happy to go there if i find out that it's the right place to go and you know yeah, china yeah. as well give me a reason to go i haven't been in i haven't been in china since 1991 as well right okay and it's just right across the street from me so i should is, go is there, there a too. reason why china is not a natural choice for the top five or six cities that we're not going to we're going to i mean you know shanghai beijing <laughs> shenzhen guangdong all those kind of cities why? Why? You know, just market size. Why are we going there? I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. Why? Aren't they, why? Why isn't China in the top five or six? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's just so well developed and so well known. Right. Like I don't know if I have anything to add, and I've said this before by using the word edge, right? I don't know if I have an edge in China, and I don't know if I have anything to add, right? So we used to joke that like if you started a company that does X, whether it's fintech or ad tech or ed tech or something like that, and then you try to move that company to China, there are already 40,000 other potential people just because of the population size. They're doing the same thing. Right, and I submit to you that China is past the point where it's like copycatting and ripping people off. I think that I think that period of China's history is over. The point is though that if there are 1.2 or 1.3 billion people, somebody's probably had your idea. Yeah. And because their addressable market is so large, I mean, China has the largest number of cities, probably over 10 million people anywhere in the world, just because of its country size. Oh, yeah, that's and good. That's I, just I just don't, I just don't know if I have a lot to add. I want to go. Yeah, yeah. And if somebody right. makes a compelling reason for us to go, I'm there. We're there. Yeah, exactly. No question about it. Like I'd, I'd love go. I'd love to go there. Like I said, I haven't been back in 20 years. So for me, more 25. Yeah. So I'd love to be there. But right now, I don't think I have anything to add. But I think if I go to these other cities, I could potentially add something there and give them exposure and get insights there that other people may or may not have. That's what I yeah. think. Uh, there's so many cities we've left out as well, and. Yeah. I don't even name the countries that we left out because as soon as we name them, you know, that's another 20 minutes to the podcast is talking about that country, right? But there's a whole bunch of places we missed out. I'm sure people could tweet us. They can tweet us at Asia Tech Pod or hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. Let yep. us know. I mean, if there's a compelling reason to come to your city, we'll certainly consider it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no reason why we shouldn't go anywhere if someone can make a compelling reason for us to go there. So yeah, happy yeah. to do it. So we're there. We want to find out. We want to discover what makes this a great startup city. Interesting stories, fascinating stories of startup founders from the coalface, so to speak. Yep. Talk to VCs, talk to startup founders, talk to co-working space owners. Yeah. Get in contact. Yeah. And there are multiple ways to do it. Like you said, contact us on Twitter at Asia Tech Pod. You can contact me as well directly at Michael Waits. We have a Facebook page, Asia Tech Podcast on Facebook. You can sign up for and definitely, definitely subscribe to the podcast yeah. and leave us a review on iTunes. And if you leave a review on iTunes that includes a question, we will answer your question on a subsequent episode. That I, that I can promise you. Leave a review. Leave a question in the review. I'll look at those reviews. And if we see great questions, I promise I'll answer it on, on one of the next podcasts. And we look forward to seeing you in your city in Asia sometime soon. Awesome, Brent. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.